Hello and welcome back, everyone. Now, data shows uh, that to achieve the climate targets, nuclear capacity needs to triple by 2050. The problem is how do we ensure an efficient collaboration in the supply chain? So up next, we will hear from utility leaders and from new developers in technology. And they will talk all about their approach and commitment to achieve the climate targets. So up next, please give a warm welcome to Henry Samuel from the Daily Te Telegraph, who will be moderating this panel. Thank you very much indeed, Harry Ann. So, um, Ariane has already really given the, the brief. Um, the, the title here is Connecting Nuclear to the World, Rising to the Energy and Environmental Challenges. And as she said, <laughs> those challenges are pretty high. Um, we've got to triple nuclear production and reach net zero by 20. Guys, oh, we're back. We don't want to run out of power at this event. It's not good. OK, so as I said, um, these are tough challenges. Um, but the wake up call is global. And uh, as you know, actions are being taken all around the world to reach these goals. And of course, that will dis depend on various things. Um, obviously, extending the lifetime of existing fleets new build product projects, um, so the so supply chain must be sustainable, um, and we need reliability, we need sovereignty, we obviously need innovation. Can you hear me? Yep, it's back again. So, Basically, we've all got to be engaged, and we've all got to deliver. So, without further ado, please let me introduce today's uh, speakers. Give them a round of applause, please. They are the CEO of Framaton, Bernard Fontana. Mr. Eric Chassard, Executive VP, Projects and Engineering, Bruce Power. We have Florence Verzelin, Executive Vice President, Industry Marketing and Sustainability at Dassault System. Mr. Paul Howarth, CEO of the National Nuclear Laboratory in the UK, and we have an advanced nuclear developer in the shape of Mr. Dan Stout, Chief Nuclear Officer of Ultrasafe Nuclear Corporation. Come on stage and join us. Okay. So we've got a fantastic panel here. I hope you'll agree. And as Framatom is the sponsor of this panel, I think, uh, Bernard, you are allowed to start. Um, so just to kick off, the question is, how are we going to rise to the energy and sustainability challenges, given this very tight time frame? Yes, good, good morning. And uh, as recalled, yes, nuclear is uh, key to face a climate challenge, a sovereignty challenge. And today, Framatom, we are 18,000 colleagues. Uh, it's a 65 years old company. We design, uh, build, uh, maintain, produce nuclear fuel for uh, reactors. So, what can we do? First, our teams work to, on the existing fleets to extend the life of, of the reactors, the LTOs. We're also uh, working hard to increase the power of some of the reactors and uh, uh, proposing fuel for 24 month cycles. Uh, then, the world needs more equipment, and we produce equipment. And currently, we ramp up our equipment production to 3.5 gigawatt electric per year. So if you project of by 2050, it could be a contribution uh, up to 100 gigawatt of, uh, of, of new nuclear. And this is to support new nuclear, the EPR, the installed base, SMRs, new world, but also to be a, a supply chain uh, provider, a techno, techno brick provider for the, the, the different needs in the world. So to do that, we hire, we need people, and we currently hire 2,000 new colleagues every year. 
and already 2,000 new, new colleagues joined uh, since the beginning of the year. And in France also close to 500 apprentices uh, that join us uh, with diversity and we hire outside the supply chain. Otherwise, we, we, we don't help, uh, uh, we don't help uh, to, to, to achieve the, the goals. And then, on top of that, we invest. We have invested 1 billion euro in the past five years to ramp up our act, act capability. And uh, currently, we invest 1 more billion euro uh, in a three-year cycle uh, to be able to deliver those 3.5 gigawatt electric per year of equipment. So by 2050, you've got some very, very high targets, haven't you? Yes, and, uh, and the point is to, to, to start now. Huh? Uh, that's what we do. We hire, we invest, and, and we produce uh, currently equipment. So. Now, you mentioned EPR. Perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about that. What's the latest news there? Because we do have some very good news on that front. And just a second question, beyond new reactors, obviously we have life extension, we have power increase of the install base, but is there a possibility as well to restart shut down reactors? That was the other question I was interested in. So first of all, EPRs, how are we doing? So the EPRs, three are running, huh? one in Finland, uh, two, two in China. The one of France, Flamanville 3, we work hard to load the fuel early next year. In Inclay Point C, our equipments are being produced for Inkley Point C, and we already started also some equipment to replicate Inkley Point C at the size well C. And of course, in France, we uh, prepare six EPR plus potentially eight uh, for, for the French fleet. We have also exports, offers of export, like uh, in, in, in Czech Republic. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting. We can restart reactor, and we have a cooperation in the US with Holtec to restart the, the reactor of Palisade in Michigan, so to, to provide the fuel and the assistance to, to restart it. So those things happen now. And we're going to need all of that kind of activity to, to reach the goals. So just in a couple of words, what are your main challenges and, and the actions you're going to take to meet this ramp-up plan to contribute to energy and climate goals? So as we do that, safety is top priority of Ramatome. It's very important. We are keep a very strong focus on safety. Quality, we have been challenged there and we have a plan to improve our customer quality event frequency rate by 25% per year, every year, and we, we deliver that. And time, lead time. We, we take, it takes time to do nuclear and it's very important to, to review why is it so long? What can we do to, to do things faster in safety and in quality? So for me, safety, quality, lead time. And then come the people with their skills and, and their competencies, as mentioned. Come also the, the supply chain, because we work in cooperation with supply chain. It's partnership to engage them and make sure we have secured supply chain and sovereign supply chain in a world where you have a ge geopolitical challenge. Innovation is, uh, is important, is key, and I'm very pr proud that uh, yesterday Framatom teams got two awards one for the production of uh, lutetium-177 together with Bruce Power. Uh, it's a drug, it's a drug to, to cure the cancer of the, the prostate and with also de other development for cancer. And we got also an award on knowledge management. I think All you can give him a round of applause. Two awards for Framatom there and well done for Bruce Power as well. That's a great achievement. And uh, but all this is the achievement of, uh, of our partners, of our colleagues, so the, the engagement and the commitment of the employees of Framatom. We are proud to be Framatom and we are proud to work with our partner. And that's the, 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 the key word for me. Thank you very much, Bernard. I'll come back to you in just a moment. Um, give him a round of applause for, for telling, us, telling us about the latest uh, developments. Um, Bruce Power, you've just, been, you've just been mentioned. Eric Chassard. Um, just to locate, Bruce Power is uh, on the shore of Lake Huron, and it provides the cheapest source of energy through its nuclear power plants to one in three homes, hospitals, schools, and businesses in Ontario, and also produces medical isotopes um, for patients around the globe. Um, well, it's, it's, it's great that we've got you today, because I know that you, there is something topical um, 
because your, the government, the Canadian government, recently asked Bruce Power to start exploring nuclear expansion options at the site to add to uh, up to 4,800 megawatts of additional nuclear capacity. So can you share some of the opportunities you face today, again, given the race to reach the goals by 2050? Uh, yeah, we just had people who had uh, one month left and they've been completely cured. Right? So what we are announcing is that we are finding isotopes that are going to save your lives. That's what we're saying. So just to get back to, uh, to uh, Ontario, and uh, so Ontario has asked us to, uh, to provide 18, 18 electrical gigawatts of nuclear power by 2050. And uh, so we have one of the biggest sites in nuclear uh, at the Bruce Power site, a very good site, in fact, with very low seismic and very good uh, coal source. So we are going to build 4,800 electrical megawatts in the coming years, so we just started uh, the procurement process, so a request for information with very good support from the industry. And uh, we see this in uh, three stages, completing our life extension, building new nuclear on the existing site, and after opening a new site. So we are going to go through this process. Whoops. Safety first, uh, Bernard? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> that was just to make sure they were all wide awake. Safety first, yeah. So procurement process uh, up to uh, the end of uh, 2024, and after we're going to move forward, we want to find the best technology. The best technology is more than cost of electricity, right? We want safety, as you said. Uh, we want uh, constructability, easy to say, harder to do. And also we want the benefit for all the indigenous communities around us and the support of the supply chain for Ontario. So a big plan in front of us, but uh, we, we know how to do it. And we're going to, to apply the same successful recipes as the one we are using for life extension. Just to give you a couple of tricks, complete design, design completely frozen. You all know that it's the right recipe, but very few are doing it. We are doing it and we are very serious about it. And also procuring all the large engineered equipment before starting construction. So you're confident you're going to be able to up the production? Yeah, for sure. So as I said, we see this in uh, three stages. So 2050 is in 27 years, right? If I get the math Correct. right. So we see this in three stages. First stage, in the next seven years, we're going to refurb, extend the life of our existing units. And when we discuss uh, life extension at Boost Power, it's much more than grand carénage of EDF, right? We change everything. So think about it like a, a house. We just keep the walls, we open the roof, and we change everything inside, like everything. And the beauty of Kandu is that uh, we don't have one RPV. We've got 480 uh, pressure tubes, and we found a way to replace them. So we restart the reactors for 45 years, and the same as what you're doing during, uh, if you refurb your house, we are doing it better. So we install brand new innovative equipment like uh, the life-saving isotope uh, systems, but we're also increasing power of these uh, existing installations, so we will have the equivalent of one more reactor when we are done refurbishing. Next, 2030 to 2040, we are going to build this 4,800 4, electrical megawatt on the existing site. 2040 to 2050, we are going to open Greenfield, new site, when we are going to build additional large nuclear reactors. That's extremely inspiring. Um, do you have anything more to say about the isotopes? Because it is very interesting what's happening yeah, there. Yeah, so uh, I mean, to it, it, we could not do all what we are doing without partnering with uh, very innovative and, in fact, very efficient and reliable companies like, uh, like Framatome. When I discuss life extension, strong partnership with Framatome, they are replacing our gen, uh, steam generators. Uh, they are also providing innovation, like, for example, to repair buried piping. Seems easy, seems uh, simple. If we don't have this innovation, we just can't afford life extension. And also, we are innovating in life-saving uh, isotopes with new systems. The, very dif the big difference of, with what we are doing is that we can inject whatever we want in the reactor, and we get the, rea the, the result in one week. So not only we are able to mass-produce isotopes, where before you had to wait months, years for your treatment, we can supply it in one week now, but also we, we have uh, an R&D hub. We can, we can test any isotope we want in a couple of days. So that's a big game changer for cancer treatment. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Eric, let's give him a round of applause. Very exciting developments there in terms of uh, extension of life and isotopes. Now I'm going to move on to Florence. Florence uh, Verzela um, from Dassault System. Um, 
now, you're not strictly a nuclear player, but we're delighted to have you here. Um, you've made some very strong commitments to sustainability, um, um, notably 35% reduction in scope one and two uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2027, which is tomorrow, essentially, uh, and carbon neutrality by 2040. So um, you are an industrial company, and it does, you, obviously you take part in this, this challenge that we've mentioned, but beyond Dassault Systems uh, commitments, you, I would like to say, recently wrote a very interesting book called Multiverse Revolution. Um, that is on the concept of the digital twin, which you may or may not be uh, acquainted with. So um, I bring this up because it's at the heart of what, uh, what you do at Dassault Systems. So first of all, can you explain what this multiverse revolution is and the digital twin technology is and how you see it being specifically applied to nuclear plants and the nuclear industry? Thank you very much for the question. I'm delighted to be there. And Dassault System is not a nuclear player per se, but we are super committed to nuclear because we think indeed that the combination of virtual and real universe can basically change a game when it comes to build, engineer, operate, and make, pro make nuclear projects longer in operation. Basically, uh, why? Why? Because we, we are the system where we do, we do virtual twin. What is a virtual twin? A virtual twin is a digital representation of a project, a nuclear power plant, or an enterprise. And what does it allow you to do? Basically, everything. Everything as an engineer you're dreaming to do, you can do it very easily in the virtual world. You can change your materials, you can change your processes, you can create any accident on your virtual power plant in the vir in virtual universe and see how to react, what happens, and prepare to have the best operation in the real world. So what we like to do is that virtual twin extend and improve the real world. And it's extremely efficient. Right now, for example, some new nuclear projects are built with a virtual twin. And you know, when you look at a nuclear power plant, it's one of the most complex project or object. And if you want to build a nuclear power plant, you have to have thousands of engineers and specialists working on the same project, hundreds of suppliers working on the same project, and you want it to be built on time and within budget. Well, to do that, using the virtual twin, as a universal way to coordinate, to know where the project is, who is supposed to work when, is super efficient. Right now, Big Construction, which is a big player with whom we are, we are working, is able to save the time to construct by 30% just by using the virtual twin to coordinate all the suppliers. But there is even more. I was discussing with Bernard Fontana just before, and I have a dream. You know, in the United States, right now, when you look for new kind of airplanes, like the EVTOL, electric vertical takeoff landing, uh, new kind of electric planes, we are discussing with FAA to have them validated and homologated in, thanks to the 3D experience platform, in the virtual world. And in a dream, I think that in the future, in order for project, nuclear project to be quicker, to, uh, to be quicker in operation, it should be amazing that, vir that nuclear project will be validated and homologated thanks to the virtual twin of the project, which will be even better for the certification authorities. Why? Because they will be able to do hundreds or thousands of simulations. They are not going to do on a real nuclear project to see how the project is acting or reacting. And that will allow us to save years or I mean, like, at least months of construction. Uh, so that's our dream. And just to tell you that at the system, we are committed with, to nuclear, but we have proof point of that. Today, we are already working with EDF on the digitalization of their engineering in order to improve the performance of their engineering. But we are also working with some very interesting new players like Narea. Narea was able to do the, the first virtual twin of their XSMR in less than 80 months, thanks to the virtual twin. Wow. So, I mean, could you, you, could, could you actually digitize, virtualize an entire nuclear power plant? 
Yes, we could. Yes, definitely. And that's, that's the ultimate target. And it's part, as I was explaining, as I was trying to explain, it's particularly efficient if you do that before the construction. Because basically, the virtual twin can be used to do the design, the engineering, the simulation, the, ma and the manufacturing, and the operation. And if you do the design of your virtual twin, then you can use the virtual twin as designed to coordinate, to improve your engineering, do all the testing you want on your engineering, and then later on, use the virtual twin to, co to coordinate all the suppliers during construction. And later on, use your virtual twin during operation to continue to optimize your operation, but also to do predictive maintenance. So make sure that your nuclear plant stays longer in operation. Fantastic. So that's, that's a very exciting prospect. Um, just more generally, what other tools or levers, um, in your opinion, will help us reach the goals that we've been discussing here at the, at the beginning of the panel? Well, as was mentioned earlier by Bernard Fontana and Eric Chassar, I think there is a huge lever, which is the extension of life of our current power plants. And here, virtual twins can really help because you can really work on what needs to be done to extend the life, thanks to the virtual twin of your power plant. But I do believe that um, making sure that there is a better coordination with all the suppliers of of nuclear is going to be key as well if we want to achieve our goals because we only have limited times until 2050. And then there is all the new nuclear projects like the SMR project, but also the fusion projects that are going to be very helpful. Recently, we've worked with the UK Energy Atomic Agency in order to do the virtual twin of a spherical tok tokamak for fusion reactor. And it's, uh, it's a new technology that was that we were able to advance thanks to virtual and that in which we also really believe in. So there is a lot of disruption coming over. At the Asuto system, we are very happy to be contributing to tools and we are very optimistic about the future. And I mean, the, thank you very much indeed, Florence. That's absolutely fascinating uh, area that is going to presumably grow exponentially over the next few years, right? That's the goal in all domains, yes. I mean, not just nuclear, but we're going to see this in all domains. Thank you so much, Florence. Okay, I'm now going to move over to Mr. Dan Stout, who is CNO of US. Okay, it's back. It's back. So, as I was saying, Dan Stout um, of USNC, which is the Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation. Um, very exciting developments underway there, too, um, because your group is offering the very first fission battery in commercialization. That is via a fourth generation micro modular reactor, or MMR, as we say. So, Dan, tell us first of all about these MMRs and the uh, triso fuel that you use in them. Well, thank you, Henry. Um, I, it's an honor to be up here. Uh, Ultra Safe Nuclear is doing its part to achieve these goals and save the planet. Um, we have a technology. The technology is based upon the triso fuel. Uh, triso is about the size of a poppy seed, and it has several coating layers. And one of the most important coating layers is silicon carbide. It retains the fission products. We take it one step further. We encase the triso in a matrix, uh, so it's fully ceramic fuel. And, and that fuel is capable of withstanding uh, anything that can be thrown at it in terms of normal operation and emergency conditions. And it retains those fission products. So we're engineering the fuel to retain the fission products, not a large power plant. Um, we have a product. Our, it's, it's our high temperature gas reactor, micromodular reactor. It produces about 45 megawatts thermal. Uh, we're focused on generating the heat. And, and serving customers that aren't 
uh, readily serviceable by large reactors. Uh, but in so doing, we're uh, establishing a capability to produce at scale and take advantage of factory production and learning. So we're, we're uh, demonstrating the product in two projects, one in Ontario, Canada, being conducted in partnership with Ontario Power Generation, and the other at the University of Illinois. And then we're leaning into the, the establishment of the business uh, through the establishment of a reactor assembly plant in Gadsden, Alabama, and a fuel factory in partnership with Framatome uh, at their Richland, Washington facility. Fantastic. So, uh, do you see this as a game changer? Um, do you see this, Dan, as a game changer? I mean, are these smaller reactors and these new fuel, fuel types, how are they going to help us get, get down to these targets quicker? Absolutely. Um, Micromodular reactors are, have a couple advantages, starting with that safety case. That, that safety case enables us to put the reactor nearer to the uh, source needing the power. And, and that can include uh, industrial complexes that uh, we can serve through process heat. Uh, other opportunities in terms of remote communities and uh, other in, within the electricity sector in terms of behind the meter opportunities for smaller electric loads. Um, so the safety is key to lots of additional siting options. Uh, the high temperature and molten salt thermal storage system that we have as part of our standard design uh, enables coupling with intermittent renewables very well. Uh, we're able to uh, adjust and, and, and work in compatibility to achieve the needs of that location. And the smaller size uh, allows us the ability to execute more projects with a lower total cost to truly come down a learning curve and standardize. Uh, it, it's much harder to do that when every project's over a billion dollars. So we think that our micromodular reactor can help pave the way, getting regulators comfortable with this improved safety case and getting the financial community comfortable with predictable costs and schedule. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. I'd just like to bring in Bernard here because you did mention the fact that uh, you've got a partnership here to develop this triso fuel with USNC. Bernard, what's, what can you say about that? Yes, and uh, I'm very happy that we can have this uh, joint venture with USNC because we can combine very complementary resources uh, in nuclear fuel manufacturing, uh, bringing on our side uh, our industrial capability in the Richland site in uh, Washington State in the US that you have mentioned. And with this, it's an industrial plant to provide competitive and uh, reliable supply of fourth generation nuclear fuel for micromodular reactors and other advanced reactor design for USNC, but also for the, the other customers. So I think it's a it's a, an asset that is there, going to be there extremely soon, uh, at disposal of all those developments. Thank you, Bernard. Dan, perhaps a final word on uh, on the way that your your you know what your optimism in reaching the goals that we were talking about. I, I'm optimistic. Um, you know, in in the United States, back 50 years ago, 1973, 10 large nuclear power plants came online. Ten. We can do it again. Uh, it's going to take some consistent nuclear policy and some consistent market signals, but we can do it again. Thank you very much indeed, Dan Stout. Thank you, Dan. Well, <clears throat> somebody who knows all about this kind of thing uh, and looking into the long term and making the right decisions is Paul Howarth. You are CEO of the National Nuclear Laboratory in the UK, and your, her your whole raison d'etre is to help ensure the nuclear sector can deliver 
environmentally and financially affordable solutions, obviously, to some of the biggest challenges that we're facing this century. So, Paul, what do we actually need to get right to reach net zero and nuclear power generation objectives from an industrial point of view? Um, and what should the supply chain be like? There's a problem of it being joined up, you were telling me earlier. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Henry. I hope this uh, microphone lasts the uh, the course. We'll see. Uh, but um, it's 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 a real interesting challenge that we have on our hands here. This is a long term industry, and we need to ensure that to address the challenges you've raised there, Henry, that we have a long term commitment both from industry and from government working together. This needs to be a strong partnership. Picks up on some of the points that Dan was raising there. I've worked quite closely with the UK government over the, uh, the past 20 years. I was saying earlier uh, to the panelists that 20 years ago, the UK was going to phase out nuclear. And actually, we've done a complete about turn. And what we've had to do to put in place is clear and consistent messages to policymakers. This is a difficult topic for policymakers to understand. Energy alone is difficult, let alone you know nuclear and in terms of what nuclear can actually do. What we aim to put in place was clear messages of recognizing there's a portfolio of technologies and routes to solve this that nuclear can deliver. We've got large gigawatt nuclear plants. The challenge associated with that is government to get the right financing mechanisms in place. We don't really want to put any, any new science or technology into those. We know how to build those plants. We just need to get on and build them, but put the financial systems into place. The second category is small modular reactors, light water reactors. Again, very little innovation is needed in those. It's a manufacturing challenge. So we can address the point of being able to make them consistently, regularly, factory produced, uh, in a production mode. That's a manufacturing challenge. So again, government and industry has got to work together to solve that. And then the third category is the advanced systems, some that uh, Dan's talked about, uh, high temperature reactors. They need to be demonstrated uh, first. And there's a number of those projects that are ongoing around the world to demonstrate that technology. But what we've got to do as an industry sector is not confuse policymakers. Make it clear that these are not competitive systems. We're trying to work together here on all of these different routes. They're all at different stages. They need different engagements and mechanisms from government and industry uh, to work together. And hopefully what we'll get to is fleet build mode. That's the overall uh, uh, objective of the industry, which will get the costs down, which will improve certainty. The financial institutions, the pension funds will then see that this is a safe bet and that will reduce the levelized cost of, of generation. Some of the points that uh, Florence raised earlier about digitization, how do we use that to show we can build these plants consistently and regularly to, to time? With regards to the uh, supply chain that you mentioned, uh, Henry, what they need is certainty from the industry. They're not going to commit to invest if we, only, if we are only giving them the signal of one or two plants. That supply chain could go and work in aerospace, defense, uh, automotive. We have to convince the supply chain it's worth their while to make the investment because this is a long-term journey. So that consistency of long-term vision, key clear messages, and the communication that we can put across to the supply chain to invest in nuclear. Do you think that long-term vision is there now politically? Because obviously, you know, we've had some ups and downs. Um, it's very much nuclear is back in, in business throughout the world. There is really no alternative. Has that message really gone through uh, as, you, as far as you're concerned? And are you confident that we're going to build, be able to, as you say, move towards fleets, economies of scale? Yeah, I think your point there, we've had some ups and downs, and I think that summarizes it, uh, that we, we, we are moving through this slowly. It's going to take time, and that's what I often say to, to governments and to ministers. You've got to keep the faith here. This is a long-term program. We will see some of the first plants will take time, 
Uh, so we've got Hinkley Point C in the in the UK, then Sizewell C. Hopefully, we need to keep going. This is this is a long-term program, and what we'll see is the delivery of nuclear will get more certain, greater confidence, and um, then we can get into fleet build mode, as I was mentioning earlier. But we're dealing with a, a technology and an industry sector which is, these new plants, I think, are going to be on the bars for like 100 years, right? These, these new reactors. This is way beyond the time horizon that governments are focusing on and politicians are focusing on at present. And it's really difficult that this is a systems engineering approach. You know, how do, how do we help people outside the industry to say, we are not competing with solar, we're not competing with renewables or wind, you need everything to address this challenge. And we've all got to work together in a collaborative way. And this is what we need stakeholders outside the industry to understand that, but we need to help them. And there's an awareness that if we don't use it, we're gonna have serious problems producing sufficient energy, right? Yeah, I, I th absolutely. I think if, if we are not seen to be consistent and clear in our messages and working collaboratively, then we're just gonna confuse other stakeholders and, and they're just going to walk on by as far as nuclear is concerned. They'll say it's too complicated, we don't understand it, the investment is too high to start with, we don't understand the vision, we can see solar renewables uh, uh, are here and now uh, and so they'll, they'll just run with those technologies. So it's on us as an industry to help people outside the industry sector, the clarity of message and the benefit. Walking through today you see the size of the supply chain associated with, with nuclear. It is, it's fantastic. It's a really vibrant industry sector, and we need governments to, uh, to recognize that too. And as you were saying to me earlier, the importance of event, this particular event is huge, isn't it? To get people together, to collaborate, and get what you're saying is this, this, this message, you know, a, a, a simple message to the to decision makers. I, yeah, completely agree, Henry. Yeah, I think the more consistent we are in our messages and we can demonstrate to others of the size of the industry sector here, the opportunities, the jobs, uh, then we'll be in a good position for the future. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Well, we've got so much to go through here that we're, we're actually almost running out of time. So um, we're going to have to start wrapping up. Bernard, um, some very interesting uh, information we've we've listened to today. Um, everyone seems fully engaged to meet these goals we've discussed. What are your final thoughts on on, on reaching them? Yes, and you could see uh, we are all engaged huh, to to support the climate targets. But you could see that beyond being engaged, we deliver. It's happening now. Huh? And uh, for example, uh, with with Inframatom. We work on the lifetime extension of the nuclear site. Eric Chassar also explained how they do it. We contribute to increase the power of reactors, and there was also the, the testimony that this is effectively happening. And on top of that, there is new built uh, activities, and we ramp up our production capacity to 3.5 gigawatt per year of equipment. So this is, this is happening. So to support existing fleets, new built, but also a, a supply chain for uh, SMRs or, uh, or other advanced reactor. As we do that, we hire, we all invest, and also as we do it, we prepare the future. I think the example of uh, cooperation with the USNC show how uh, they lead the way for future plant generation fuel and uh, new advanced reactor, but it's also a good candidate, uh, the TRIZO, for space. And uh, so we are proud, as we do that, to, con to contribute with our technologies to other activities, health, and uh, with the Lutetium 177, so we have created Framatome Healthcare to show that, space, we have created the Framatome Space, a, a new brand. And as we ramp up, we keep focused on our priorities, safety, quality, lead time. We need further digitalization, and that has been uh, ex expressed, and, and we go through it. It helps us to improve the quality, to improve the lead time of what we are doing. Uh, also aware of uh, cybersecurity, which is a challenge, and uh, Framatome has developed internally, but also through acquisition and integration of FoxGuard solution in the US, CyberWatch in France, 
uh, 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 capability to, to support cyber security. We are not alone, we all have partners, suppliers, and the engagement of the supply chain is so essential for us. So all of us, with our employees, our colleagues who are engaged to deliver, and uh, you can count on us. Well, you've got some serious challenges ahead of you, but as we've seen, there's a huge amount of, uh, of commitment, uh, a huge amount of ideas, and a huge amount of engagement to deliver. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop it there. But ladies and gentlemen, please give a very warm applause to this fantastic panel today to talk about reaching our climate and power goals. Thank you very much indeed.